I'm Sarah Jensen, editor of OEM Off Highway, and welcome to Design and Engineering Insights. Today, I am speaking with the CEO and co-founders of Gridraster. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah, for the opportunity. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so maybe if you could kind of start, um, I know you guys do a lot uh, of work with sort of AR and VR technology. Can you maybe talk about how you've seen the technology grow and its use in the manufacturing industry or helping with uh, engineers to design new equipment? What we have seen is that in last 18 months, uh, the, the de devices have started becoming much better available, much better devices. and. Uh, like, uh, so we have been in the following and investing time and helping the companies for three, three years now. But in the last 18 months, what we have seen is that a lot of those pilot projects that were happening or ROIs have been proven. And now we are seeing real scale where number of devices that are being getting deployed are not in like tens or twenties. Now these are like 500 to 1000 devices. And next year there will be, these will be in thousands and thousand devices. Uh, we are people have gone a very clear ROI on uh, uh, design, like uh, and basically what we are seeing is that wherever the uh, nowadays the complex machines they are being designed in a very custom manner. It's not like they are generating building these like mil, uh, a lot like in the massive quantity. So for example, a car when you are designing it, uh, uh, typically what you are doing is that you are bringing in your physical objects like how will your a GPS unit look like, how will your radio units look like, you're, you're using those on a physical prototype which is made out of foam, uh, cardboard foam. So it, these things take like three week time to put things together, you are chiseling the foam. Now with AR and VR you can do this visualization within like a couple of hours, it doesn't, so you're saving a lot of time and there's a lot of pressure on uh, basically uh, getting these uh, very complex machines uh, manufactured or, or released or launched on a certain date. Uh, same thing we are seeing is on an aerospace side that if these machines don't get ready on the time day that the, say a spaceship is getting launched, that uh, that day, uh, another day is not there. They don't get another chance to launch it in another say three years. So a lot of work where they're trying to do this iterated design process, which takes three weeks time, four weeks time. And on top of that also, uh, by the time you are doing this physically assembling things, your design might have changed. So uh, all of those with uh, AR and VR, it becomes like, it's, it's instantaneous. You can keep changing your design, keep iterating, and now you have suddenly cut down a lot of design time by like weeks in this process. And if you add it up for like, it, these things go for six, six months to let's say two to three year design cycle, if you cut down six months, that's a huge saving for these companies because they can keep innovating more and more. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the manufacturing, again, we are seeing also that for the training, it has been really useful because people really are able to get trained on this. Uh, because nowadays, a lot and lot, lot custom parts are coming. So the uh, basically, the manufacturing uh, peop, uh, the, the team members need to get used to get trained very fast and mixed reality is like it really it's a very good learning tool uh, it's forgiven but in manufacturing it really helps that now you're uh, you're able to train people in like in weeks the people can start working doing the similar job what they used to take like say months to get trained manufacturing i would say that in manufacturing floor uh, there are clear use cases of error detection where error, error is very expensive Mm -hmm. What we are seeing is that it will take another one year, another year because devices are still expensive. So uh, I, I, all the big ones like Microsoft, Google, um, Apple, everyone is working. So it will come to that point where devices will, you can start man, deploying it at production floor. But use cases are very clear. People have proven that error detection gives a huge benefit. Like now, earlier you have external camera, all of those setting to detect these errors. Now you have this information overlay whenever you need it. So all of those scenario, basically it is very clear use case, but we see that another one year it will start getting deployed. And the, and the last one is basically in the maintenance because nowadays manufacturers are not selling just the uh, machines. They are selling the uh, whole, uh, so they're selling the whole package that they will sell the machi machine, but they will also sell overall the maintenance on that for like say three to five years. And, um, and because the information is always in context, you can now, uh, you don't need a 
ex expert to always there. Now you can, even uh, someone who is not that much trained, they can start doing a lot of these maintenance and wear that. They jump if you want to add something. Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, Rishi kind of covered most of the ground. Uh, in, in actually in the manuf manufacturing setup, I think it's a pretty well-known problem. The, the, the skill gap, which is, which has been kind of building up because of the baby boomers who are about to kind of uh, retire mm -hmm. and you have the new uh, uh, people who are coming in, they need to be quickly kind of ramped up. And this has been a saving grace uh, for most of the manufacturers. And, um, you know, just to cite, cite an example, like uh, in one of the largest aerospace and defense companies, you have an uh, engineer who is like coming in with barely one years of experience. He's able to kind of work uh, at, a, uh, uh, at a rate, which is almost like A4 level, which takes somewhere like four to five years for somebody to kind of come to that level. Uh, and that is, that has been a, you know, that has been a humongous help in terms of kind of shaping up this, uh, you know, reducing this uh, skill back skill gap, which has been kind of building on for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think rest of the things like Rishi kind of covered. Uh, so that's something I wanted to add. Okay, great. Um, well, that kind of fits in with my next question. I was going to ask what maybe specifically was driving the growth. Um, Rishi mentioned before, it, kind of in the last 18 months, was it that you've really seen an increase in that? Is it simply because of that? Is it the um, benefits in how long the reduced production time or design time and the skills gap, or are there any other factors that have helped drive growth more recently? Do you want me to take it over? So, uh, so one thing, the big, uh, big thing that we have seen is that like um, uh, AR and VR has been there for 30, 40 years and a lot of it was, uh, there were a couple of uh, issues that devices were never that good. In last three, four years now, uh, really good devices have come out, but still device were not available. Like if you look at AR HoloLens 2 device, it was announced last year in Feb that HoloLens 2 is the first commercial device. Like before that, it, uh, Microsoft was still treating HoloLens as a development device. Uh, just now, now HoloLens 2 has been starting being manufactured at the massive scale. And even today, because of uh, the whole pandemic, unfortunately, the supply chain, everything is uh, in the, uh, disrupted. But this is the device now we are able to see that our customers can buy in thousands. So for on the just on the deployment front, a lot of our manufacturing customers, they understand AR and VR very well because earlier they will deploy these really expensive systems. So... Uh, which like, for example, in manufacturing aerospace customers will deploy a cave system, which is kind of, a, it gives you a experience, but it's like so expensive that you can't really deploy it like at leisure. Now with AR and VR, you can deploy this to every person. And now, so I would say that devices were definitely a big uh, factor. Now, as the devices started becoming available, the customers needed some time to really, because now the art, suddenly the use cases have become much more uh, wider. So earlier, a $10 million cave, or uh, you can only do uh, deploy one. You can only you can only deploy into very specific use cases. So then the customers basically started testing ROI. And these customers, they have been working with the initial Oculus devices, initial HoloLens, and it took them, so they have been uh, betting on different use cases. So it took them two, three years just to test out that where real ROI are, and then, with the device available now where they can deploy it in thousands and thousands now. So the last 18 months, that's why we started seeing a huge ramp up. Okay. And so um, are there any sort of challenges or hurdles associated with um, a company possibly wanting to integrate uh, AR, VR technology into their processes? And is that something um, Gridraster is able to help them with or? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, so. One of one of the key things was which Rishi was kind of pointing out as well was uh, you know when you are deploying anything at the enterprise level, you are actually looking at both the performance and the scale because you really want to kind of drive the value. Okay, mm -hmm. and that has been like uh, uh, m multiple challenges when it comes to kind of deploying that uh, at scale. 
uh, on devices which you want to be mobile. I mean, the untethered, uh, the the tether options of like the um, the Oculus uh, uh, Rift and the the Vive, full, they were never an option uh, for mass deployment. That was well, that was better place for the gamers to kind of play around with that. Uh, so uh, while deploying this, I mean, the, the biggest problem they have been facing, like if you go to a lo lot of this large manufacturer and particularly in design and engineering, they have pretty large CAD data models. I mean, they, they're pretty large and kind of heavy. And today, if you want to kind of run that on a Microsoft HoloLens or any of this untethered device or Oculus uh, uh, Quest, uh, it's, it's a big challenge because you have to kind of spend, um, um, you know, days and uh, weeks and months trying to kind of optimize this assets to kind of fit into all these devices, um, uh, which, which has been one of the biggest reason why um, a lot of these companies have not been able to kind of um, scale. They're pretty limited in terms of going through this intensive uh, data preparation, uh, which, which was a, a huge challenge. Uh, and secondly, like when you are uh, looking at the mixed reality where I'm looking at kind of overlaying the virtual objects on top of the physical assets, you are actually looking at high, high precision of kind of overlays. Mm -hmm. And that has been another challenge because today all the standalone devices which are available because of the compute capabilities that is there on the device, they can only, uh, you know, do so much. Like maybe they will be able to identify a plane surface and be able to anchor something. But when you're working on a uh, industrial setup or a manufacturing setup, you are actually working with shapes which are of different size and different uh, varied, uh, you know, lighting environments. Uh, and that that's something uh, a standalone device, um, the current setup is not able to achieve. Uh, that's where we kind of come in because we bring in the, the compute of the cloud. Okay, we are uh, in a way um, um, making the making the compute on the standard device kind of uh, redundant. Now we can bring in those high-end experiences like uh, onto those devices by leveraging the cloud. We offloading the compute intensive tasks to the cloud and then kind of taking care of all the technical challenges. How you bring that on onto even a low end uh, device. Uh, so that's something which, I mean, we have been kind of able to um, help. And that's why you see, you know, a uh, lot of people kind of uh, going after the cloud-based uh, approach to kind of deploy it, because without this, uh, you, you know, you cannot really uh, scale these deployments and which, is one of the key things if they're kind of putting that effort and trying to put going through this uh, pilots and uh, POCs, the idea is to be kind of deployed to scale, which is at enterprise level. So yes, uh, we, we are resolving some of those big problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, and are there um, maybe specific, um, I don't know, for this applications or types of manufacturing or design process for which AR versus VR might be better and vice versa, or can they kind of be used for all types of processes? Uh, uh, no, I, I think the, 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 there are scenarios where VR definitely stands out over AR and there are scenarios where AR uh, kind of stands out. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so particularly if you're looking at like creating a synthetic environment where you are looking to kind of train people, okay? And uh, there's nothing like VR because you don't really have to put them into the real setup. You can actually have the synthetic uh, uh, setup uh, prepared and somebody can go through that intensive uh, training. For example, like if you want to uh, do a fire drill, okay, and you want to kind of develop the muscle memory, you don't really have to kind of set things in fire, right? You can actually do that, do that in, in VR or uh, you are trying to train them on some expensive equipments. I mean, somebody can train them some, like as many times as possible in a VR environment without really uh, damaging any of that um, uh, equipment. So uh, yes, I mean, VR kind of stands out uh, in that scenario. But when it comes to kind of delivering like on, on the on the product on the production lines, uh, definitely kind of AR uh, comes in. Basically, the idea is uh, the AR is you you basically getting assisted in your day to day kind of work. So it okay. provides you the relevant information in a such a way that it makes your whole task much much uh, uh, easier. So yes, I mean uh, they have their different use cases uh, and they definitely fits in in different places. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. 
Um, well, those are all the questions I had for right now. I don't know if you guys have anything else you'd like to add or think our audience should know either about um, AR, VR trends or kind of what your grid raster offers. Um, I think I think uh, I, I think at a uh, basic level, like uh, I think VR and AR. I think the immersive uh, medium is one of the medium which possibly for the first time um, we we talk about that golden triangle. Either you can make things faster, better, or or cheaper. Like that whole triangle. In a way, um, you know, the AR VR kind of breaks that uh, uh, limitation. Now you can actually do things faster, better, and cheaper. Mm -hmm. by using the the immersive medium and that's the reason uh, you, you are seeing like uh, uh, all of uh, the the value um, of that medium and it's kind of beginning to kind of uh, um, people are beginning to kind of realize it and as and when the devices are, are getting uh, available and the enabling technology like us which is kind of coming up uh, yes the this, uh, this uh, the trend seems uh, pretty good and it's beginning to kind of scale up pretty well um, I think uh, uh, that's all there is. Uh, uh, I think that nothing, nothing much uh, more to add. Uh, the, the one more thing I might, I might add is a lot of those like early uh, uh, um, adopters who have kind of picked up that medium has over a time period kind of developed a pretty uh, uh, evolved thought process as to how do you kind of implement this technology. Uh, to the to the uh, to the manufacturing floor uh, or, or to the whole product life cycle. Uh, so, design and engineering. How do you do that in the operations? How uh, how do you do it during the sales? How to do it after sales? And for every organization, it really um, happens in a certain uh, you know in a certain way because you want to show the value. Um, or the return of investment, uh, which is kind of easier to kind of showcase uh, in the initial ones. And, and then once you kind of prove that and slowly integrate into the whole um, life cycle of the product. So yes, um, definitely that's, that's something which has been good to kind of work with some of our customers who have been kind of implementing it that way. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, great. Thank you very much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah, for it. Thanks, Sarah.